Hey everyone, I just want to take a minute to tell you about my Amazon number one best selling book, Culture of Excellence. How do culture and leadership impact the performance of a team? For the past 30 years, one organization in baseball has stood taller than all of the rest the New York Yankees. In Culture of Excellence, Colin Sumelia, that's me, takes us inside baseball's most successful franchise to uncover compelling and useful lessons in leadership. Culture of Excellence is transformative in its premise. It shares strategies you will want to apply and knowledge you can acquire to effectively improve your team and motivate your people. With three foundational pillars, you can become a more effective leader and build a culture of excellence through stories from the Yankees. And you can purchase your copy of Culture of Excellence from any online retailer. There are hard copy, ebook, and audiobook versions available. You can also purchase a hard copy of the book directly from me, and I will personalize it for you and send you swag items like a bookmark and a sticker. Head over to www.talent409.com backslash culture dash of dash excellence to view all of your options and learn how you can discover your talent altitude through my book, Culture of Excellence. Welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Colin Cernelia. Thank you for joining us today, and please head over to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team with their leadership and culture development. Wherever you are in the world, and whether it's the seven pillars of dynamic leadership, culture pyramid building, or anything else, let our team of experts help you discover your talent altitude. This podcast is available on Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. You can help the show grow by taking a minute and leaving a rating and review on your podcast listening platform or by sharing this episode with a friend and on social media. And episode 136 of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast is upon us. And our guest for this episode is Ashley Fontes Comber. Ashley is a soccer fanatic through and through, much like I am with baseball. It was awesome to hear about how much passion she has for the game, not just during her playing days, but now how she wants to pass that down to the future generations and younger girls specifically. She is the founder of the Girls Academy after the United States Soccer Academy shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. She was the first Hispanic female COO for a team in the National Women's Soccer League. She is an expert on all things leadership and she played college soccer at a great program in Florida State University. So we get to talk all about that and what she learned from that incredible culture. So let's not waste any more time and let's dive right into this talk. Here is my conversation with Ashley Fontes Comber. Okay, everyone, welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, my guest with me is Ashley Fontes Comber. Ashley, thank you so much for joining the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here too as well, and we have a ton to talk about today. So let's start the conversation. Let's give the listening audience a little context and a little background into who you are. So please tell us, who are you? Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you about myself in my current state because it's always changing, <laughs> right? So I, I'm currently finishing up my doctorate degree at Florida State University. Um, at the same time, I'm in my third year serving on the United Soccer Coaches Board of Directors, um, which is the largest coaches association in the world. And uh, then I've also, you know, with with all the craziness that's happened in the pandemic, so did the the demise of the, the youth uh development academy that U.S. soccer was running, operating and funding. Um, and then from that rose the the girls academy. So I'm also working with them to get that off the ground and serving that board, uh, serving the girls academy on their board of directors. 
Awesome. So let's start with soccer then. That seems like a natural tie-in to a lot of things <laughs> in your life. And I know you played competitive soccer all the way through at the Division One level at Florida State before taking on all of these other ventures that you're currently doing and have done before. Tell us a little bit about you know when soccer really entered the picture. Like when did you know you, that was something you were going to take pretty seriously? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's funny because soccer, I think it's just one of those things I could never get rid of. <laughs> right. Um, but in a good way. So from a, a very young age, I, I love to compete. Like if I have one brother, he's, um, just barely a year older than me. And it's like, Oh, go get this. I was always <laughs> racing him. Right. It was always a competition. Um, and growing up, I, you know, knowing I love to compete, I was in every sport possible, uh, you know, swimming, tennis, softball, track, volleyball, football, basketball, and then soccer, of course. Um, I think the the competitiveness just came through our lifestyle that we led. My my dad and and his brothers were professional football coaches. Um, they coached at the, the collegiate level, D1, and then they also coached in the NFL. So I think that kind of constructed my reality. Um, and maybe, you know, initially I learned to compete – because I was competing for my dad's attention. Okay. And then maybe I would think then it just naturally evolved into something that became my own. Um, and then not to mention, since my dad was a coach, we moved around a ton. And so playing sports was like my saving grace, right? Of just making friends. I didn't know how to make friends any other way. Um, and then naturally, as I got older, you know, the, the level of competition stepped up. And then your coaches started to change a little bit, right? So it's no longer your choice and you want to have fun doing all these other sports and challenging yourself. It's what the coach wants you to do. And it's really unfortunate, right? Um, I It was my sophomore year in high school and I was playing three sports. I was told I couldn't play, you know, two other ones. Um, and then one of my coaches, he made me quit the one the sport I was playing volleyball he made me quit volleyball I had a job he made me quit my job and then he started to try to get me to quit playing soccer and at that that was a major turning point because I was starting on the varsity basketball team and starting on the varsity soccer team and I was also playing AAU basketball and travel soccer and at the time like ODP was the pathway to go with soccer um and it was just, it was a terrible situation to be in as a kid, you know? So I could not quit soccer because I had been playing soccer since I, I think I was in first grade. Um, but I love basketball. I grew up watching Magic Johnson and, you know, the Lakers and Showtime, you know? So I was, I had, I was hell bent on, hey, I'm going to go play college basketball and soccer. That's, that was my dream. Um, so that was cut short and that's how I ended up with soccer. Um Fortunately, it still all worked out because I was still able to uh, really get into something that I loved. And it's kind of carried me through my life at this point. So I've been very loyal to soccer because I think it's been pretty loyal sure. to me. And seems to have afforded you so many cool opportunities that you're obviously still a part of today. And I'm, uh, it's so, we have a connection, Showtime Lakers. That was the team, I, those teams my dad <laughs> fell in love with when my parents lived out in California. So I was a Laker fan yeah. growing up too <laughs> because of all of that and, and everything. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think I actually have my, my dad's Magic Johnson jersey still now that I'm thinking about it. Oh. So. <laughs> Yeah, you have to hang on yeah. to that one. That's like that's one you pass down for yeah, generations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like the the three is coming off a little bit, so I got to figure a way to sew it back on. I got to ask my mom how to teach me teach me how to sew again. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, before yeah. I I want to talk about you know what led you to Florida State. Obviously, a, a really great program, and we'll talk about that in a second. But one of the elements that you brought up is just the the juxtaposition between you know wanting to be a kid and play sports and make friends and just enjoy the environment that you're in versus taking that next step and you know maybe competing and going all in and and I think that you see this a lot with coaches and I'm sure this is one of the reasons why you are involved in a coaching uh a coaching association now is to to make sure that you know coaches have such a 
important responsibility, especially when we're talking about kids, when we're talking from what, five, four or five years old, when you kick your first soccer ball uh, all the way through high school, how influential adults are in kids' lives. And uh, I know I right. dealt with some of those same challenges, uh, definitely not at the same degree. I was never a Division One <laughs> uh, student athlete, and I, I didn't have maybe the same stakes that you did, but I saw a lot of those same things that you talked about. So, you know, as far as that disconnect goes, I guess, between what a coach wants versus what the child wants, how do we bridge that gap? Like, how do we make it so that it's more of a harmonious relationship? Right. I, I think that's a, it's a tall order and certainly a challenge. Um, but you're, you're spot on. I mean, that situation I was put in was certainly one of the reasons why when I eventually became a coach, I did because I wanted to advocate for those youth athletes. Um, you know, it's, it's so infuriating to look back and then to see it happen consistently all the time, it, whether it's you're playing at the highest level competitively or just wreck, you know, these kids are eight years old and the, these dads or moms are out there and they're playing like, you know, the only the best kids and not any of these other kids that just want to get out yeah. there and play. Um, so too often it's it, the adults, whether it's the parents or the coaches, we too often dictate what is best for that athlete based on what's best for us as the adult, right? And not the okay, other way around. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem. We're either seeking glory through our kids or that coach needs their own self victories, right? And they're not concerned about developing the kid or realizing, hey, look, these kids, as adults, we have a responsibility. These kids, they only have one chance to be a youth athlete. They only get that experience once. And we are responsible for that experience because we don't give, except for what we're doing right now in the Girls Academy, we don't give those kids a voice to say, hey, I want to do this or have that conversation about, you know, with being able to comfortably have a conversation with a coach to kind of say, Hey, I'm, I'm being pushed too much, or can I take, take it back somewhere? Can I get pushed more? Um, or, you know, just making it more about the whole player, that athlete and the person. I, I think that's where, where we really fail um, in the majority of areas as, as coaches. Yeah. And I think you clearly see it. And I mean, especially at the high school level, starting there. And I think to your point, it's even creeping into some of the lower levels where I, I have this conversation, not just with myself in my own head all the time, but with other coaches that I'm working with, or with parents, and even with the student athletes that I work with. And one of the reasons I love working at the high school and the collegiate level, like in the amateur space, is because it is more about development. It's more about, you know, skill development. It's more about the leadership development, like the things that we do through our academy. But where there's always the friction is we need to win because if I don't win, then I don't keep my job. <laughs> and and so like winning isn't, you know, I, I always say that winning shouldn't be the only thing that you're focusing on, but winning affords coaches the opportunity to keep doing what they're doing. So if they're not doing that, especially at the college level and even at the high school level now these days, then they're getting pushed out the door for someone who they think will get the job done from a winning perspective. So right. like from, you know, maybe if you could break it down a little bit in maybe a percentage, like when, when you see development versus winning at the amateur level, like how important is it for you to like distinguish between those two? And like, what are you more focused on? For me, I think it's so that it's really problematic on how we assess how to win, right? If you as a coach are developing players, you will win. It's just going to take time. You have to put the time in the process to develop those players. Because then if, if you're developing the players, you're going to have more success on the field. You're also going to have more retention in those players. Because that's the other thing we see a lot in youth sports is that you have, especially like the higher levels, you have a lot of turnover on teams because, hey, the last like three or four kids off the bench in any sport, well, they're, they're not playing. So they're not developing and they need to get reps, not only in practice, but they need to be put in game time situations so they can really learn and push mm -hmm. their limits. Well, if that's not happening, they leave the team. So then that coach is constantly rebuilding. So you're not a successful coach because 
it, it should be a successful coach should be reflective on where their player goes next. Right. So after they've, they've been on my team, are they going, are, are they being recruited to play in college? And then at what level and what exposure opportunities are they giving or are given to develop? That's how I should be judged. And guess what? The wins are, are secondary. Those are going to happen yeah. because of the, the time and effort you are investing as a coach in developing those players, you know, and you should, I mean, on the youth side of things, you should have at least, I mean, it would take a fall season to kind of correct things. And then you should really see some results. I would think in the, you know, the springtime, that would kind of be my gauge of, of how the development process. Goes. Yeah. And I love the reminder that it, it takes time. And so often I think when we're trying to fix a broken culture or we're trying to figure out how to better develop our people, it's a reaction to something negative that is happening within our team or within our organization. Like we don't, we don't take enough proactive approaches to, to, you know, strengthen. Like I, I think about it with meditation all the time. Like I'm totally guilty of it. It's something that makes me feel really good, helps me get into a great mindset and it consistently falls off my plate. And the only time it ever comes back on is when I feel like I'm a little bit stressed out or something you know, is going on. And then I have to remind myself that it shouldn't be something, it's it's not like a, a drug or something that can help me feel better. If I do it all the time, then I get into less funks and you, know, I, you get a little bit more consistently. So I feel like it's kind of along those same lines with all that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's talk then about Florida State and uh, obviously <laughs> still part of your life. And uh, obviously I'm guessing is just, you know, really ingrained in you at this point, but there had to be a starting point, you know, an opportunity to say like, okay, Florida State is a place that I can call home for my collegiate career. Was there something about the school? Was there something about the program, the team, the coaching staff that really drew you to play there for your collegiate career? Oh, yeah, sure. Certainly. So I had actually verbally committed to Michigan State oh, wow. um, to play because I was I mean, that's where my friends were going, you know, like my school friends. Um, my brother was at Michigan State. Uh, my uncle had played at Michigan State. Um, the coaches were phenomenal to me. They were just they were very engaged and active and everything. Um I had gone on my recruiting visit to Florida state and, you know, I, I just came back and said, I'll just, you know, go to Michigan state. Um, and I think it would have been a great fit except for the fact that you go back to the beginning of the story where I said, I love to compete, right? Not saying that Michigan state wasn't competitive. I think they, they did a good job with their program. Again, phenomenal coaches there with how they treated their players. Um, but I wanted to compete against the best. And at the time, the best was the ACC. So I kind of had this, this second, like, as, it, as the deadline started getting closer to signing day, I'm like, oh, my <laughs> gosh, something's just not settling well. I had such an amazing time on my, my recruiting trip to Florida State. And I'm like, I want to play against UNC. I want to play against these. I, I want to play against Abby Wambach at, at University of Florida. You know, not they weren't ACC, but um, I wanted to play against those players that you, you always hear about, right? And so that I ended up um, having a really hard conversation with my parents, first of all, that were just like, are you out of your mind? You gave your word. You know, we come from a, a culture that it's, if you say you're going to do something, you yeah. do it. And I had to go back on my word. And, you know, my dad said, Hey, if they, if you, if Florida state still has scholarship money for you, then you can go. So I talked to, to coach Baker, um, who was there, they were able to work something out for me. And then I had to talk to Michigan state and tell them that unfortunate news. Um, but honestly, Florida state was, the first place that felt like home to me, I think that was also a, a piece, not just the athlete side, but look, let's, let's be honest that, you know, I went to a school where there weren't a lot of minorities, you know, it was, it was predominantly um, white and um, very wealthy area. And it was, I just never felt comfortable, never felt like myself. And when I went to Florida State, I'm like, wow, 
I'm like, there's other people like <laughs> me here and not just you. There's like a lot. And there's so many commonalities. And it was just like, gosh, darn, I could be, I can be the best player that I can be here competing against the best players that I want to compete against. And I can also find myself. Um, so Florida State was amazing. It was the best. I turned four years into five and it was the the best time of my youth life. <laughs> <laughs> and I came out with the greatest friends ever, you know, just a a complete and total bond uh, that'll that'll never end with everybody that plays at Florida State, whether they were there when I was there or not. Sure, you know. Sure, and you've mentioned a couple times now, and I just want to highlight it because it's true for me. Some of my best friends that I've ever made have been through athletics, and I'm not saying that's the only way to make friends, but it seems <laughs> it seems like you have some really strong bonds with your teammates as well throughout the years, and that's something that is carried over. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. But then when I get to, you know, I made it to adulthood, I'm like, now how am I supposed to make friends? So I don't, I can't just go out there and kick somebody's rear across the field anymore. I'm like, I, I need to work at this. So it is, it is very different among the many challenges of when you give up the, whatever sport you're playing and try to transition into a more quote unquote normal life, I, I guess. But exactly. so Obviously, the decision to go to Florida State was the right one. And as hard as it was to go back on your word, I mean, I, I love the self-awareness piece, though, in, in all of that at such a young age to you know, be that mature to make a decision like that and to communicate it, that decision versus, you know, just go, I, I don't even know how you would decommit without communicating. But I'm sure there's ways that people have done that before. And it mm -hmm. probably doesn't look very good. But and yeah. so um, I want to, if we can right. uh, talk a little bit about your time then playing soccer at Florida State and maybe some of the uh, lessons that you learned on the field and in competition and uh, even through some of the adversity, what the culture was like. Can you give us a little glimpse into what those great five years were all about? Yeah, it was, it was certainly challenging. Like, you know, they say, be careful what you wish for. Right. <laughs> and it was, um, again, I, I did just something that wasn't the best where once I committed to Florida state and that pressure was like off my shoulders, I went all out my senior year in high school and not in a good way. Right. I wasn't training like I should be training. I came to Florida state preseason so unfit. And it was such a big mistake because when I got there, coach Baker brought me in his office. He's like, he was so excited. I was there. He had all these like hopes and dreams and how I was going to fit in and, you know, and like right away, make an impact. And then the next day we get up and we to do our fitness testing and I'm like, Oh no. And it was, it was a great lesson for me on relationships right? Especially with your coach. So um, I came in from day one and I let him down. And that was really hard because what he did for me at the last minute to make sure I could get down there. And then I came and I didn't show up. So it was a lot of um, freshman year doing and me realizing that I, wow, I really messed up. I'm not playing much. Um, in the fall season. So I'm doing extra training sessions. I'm doing breakfast club, extra fitness. Like I'm doing everything in my power to one, prove to the the coaching staff and the team that, hey, I want to be here and I'm, I'm committed to be a part of this team. Um, and I, I carried on through the winter to where the, the spring season I was starting. And um, it was a great lesson and something I just, I didn't want to let go of at that point. And um, that kind of it carried through definitely the to sophomore year where we went out and we set all kinds of records. Like we came out of nowhere. It was the first time for Florida State. I was in the I played center back and um, it was the first time for Florida State to make it to the NCAA playoffs or yeah, to the playoffs. Um, we went to we beat UF at home um that was amazing and we which they didn't hadn't done before we beat unc for the first time in program history um we had we set records for the least goals scored against um you know there were just so many magical moments in that season um and that was because of 
you know, just this, this commitment that we had to kind of change the program. And it was coach Baker's second year there. So he was really working hard to, to kind of cultivate a, a new culture and into a, a winning culture. Um, and then we, you know, so the two seasons we went to the sweet 16 and unfortunately, you know, well, the one highlight was we did knock UF out um, of the playoffs, which was always fun because they're our, <laughs> our rival, right? Um, but then my senior year, we lost the Sweet 16 to UConn, and that was just, that was a devastating moment. But um, it was just a really good lesson, four years of playing about relationships um, and how to navigate them because you're still pretty, you, you really need – a good coach to guide you because you're still really immature when you think about mm -hmm. it, right? How to process, um, you know, if you're not starting one, one game, it's like, well, how do you deal with that? Right. If you're expecting to start, do you go and pout? Do you go talk to your coach? Do you, how do you address those issues? And a lot of the time we had to kind of work through it ourselves. And I would say that I learned that you can't hold that stuff in. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be, the guide of your destiny. You can't rely on anybody else to do it but yourself. So uh, a lot of great lessons came out of that that I still hold on tight to and, and kind of guide me through some some situations I get into now. Even. Sure. And, you know, I love that, you know, you talk again about how important coaches are. And it's not to say that, you know, as a student athlete, you're incapable of making your own decisions and being able to develop right. on your own. But I mean, the brain isn't even fully developed yet at that age. And so, right. you know, how are you supposed to be able to comprehend everything that is being put on your plate, especially when you're talking about big time division one level athletics? And, um, so I love, again, just reiterating the importance of a great coach, and I'm sure it was a great coaching staff as as well. Yeah. Was there um, the next tier down, were there players on those teams, maybe yourself included, that were able to take on some of those leadership responsibilities and able to fill in those gaps, like when a coach couldn't, you know, NCAA re regulations, you know, keeping them from being with you at certain times and at different points in the year. So were there different players that were able to step in and like how did you how did you see them kind of grow into that leadership position um and because uh, it's not the same obviously but uh, you're you're in the trenches because you're the players and you're the ones doing the work so it, it is still very important i believe <laughs> yeah yeah and i i would say i think leadership is very subjective and contextual mm -hmm. right so uh, somebody that may have stepped up to be a leader one year might not have the okay. next year because it's a different situation, right? And um, everyone has different skill sets and attributes that they can contribute at different times. But yeah, there were there were certainly some great leaders on the team. Um, and it, it like, again, it changed because one year we might have a recruiting class that just went with the flow and it was great. And then another year we might have a recruiting class that was just totally unhinged and you, need, you needed some, some leaders to really be able to reel them in and keep a, a good cohesive unit because the more successful we became, the more protected we almost became as a team, right? And that it could be a double-edged sword yeah. because now you're so protective, it's, it's even more important than for your veterans to just find some commonalities with those rookies so you can bring them into instead into the circle instead of excluding them out and saying, Hey, you got to earn your way. Um, and that just wasn't the case. Again, just some cultural changes where, you know, my senior year or sorry, my freshman year, we, I mean, you're not supposed to do hazing, but there was certainly hazing and it wasn't fun. It just, it was a bit demeaning at times. Um, and then by the time it's, yeah, I think it was like my sophomore, freshman year, it's like that stuff just didn't have sophomore, junior, that stuff just didn't happen anymore. Like we don't want the freshmen carrying our bags around in the airport, just like dumb stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Right. <laughs> Nothing crazy, but, but it devalues you as a, a human. It's not, you're not earning your stripes worth anything. You know, if anything, you earn your stripes in how you prepare for practice and how you train at practice and how you contribute in games. Um, 
but we certainly had some some really good leaders step up. Some stepped up just through their own performance. Um, and some were, were able to do a lot of great, like social activities <laughs> for the, the team get togethers. Sure. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a, a lot of good, good people yeah. in that group. Yeah. And you're reminding me, uh, one of my all time favorite athletes is CC Sabathia, former pitcher for the Yankees. And, uh, he came up through the Cleveland Indians organization and he was a victim of hazing in the organization and something that he did not enjoy <laughs> uh, one, one bit. He's not shy about that. Um, and, and I love Sabathia for a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously he was a really good athlete and that's, you know, from an entertainment standpoint, but um, you know, he's somebody that has gone through his own, you know, personal battles. He battled alcoholism uh, has gone to rehab and, and different things like that. So I think he's somebody that is very dynamic in a lot of ways. And one of the things that stands out the most about his story is like, for example, when he got to the Yankees, and I don't know that it was necessarily a problem that needed to be addressed, but he said, he was like, Hey, we're not going to have any type of hazing on the Yankees because mm -hmm. I went through it. It's terrible. And basically what he says is like, how do you expect somebody new coming in to contribute when you're not making them feel a part of the team? And like, it's, it sounds so simple, but like to, to your point, I think like sometimes, especially, you know, older people, they on the team maybe need to, they need to feel like they can control you and they don't, they don't want to lose their place on the team, their standing and, and all that type of stuff. But I think that says more about their own insecurities than it does about their ability to actually lead. Right. No, absolutely. Right. I think, yeah, it definitely shines through people that are are uh, more aggressive with those type of things. It is, it is an insecurity yeah. thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned some of the social aspects and uh, they might've been uh, on the field. They might've been in the clubhouse. They could have been off the field. Can you share some of those uh, some of those events or some of those gatherings that were really impactful. Cause I know, I know coaches and I know even student athletes maybe are always looking for ideas, especially in COVID world. I don't know how much <laughs> of these things apply, but right. how can, how can we be together? How can we do things and, and get closer? <laughs> yeah. God, it's wow. What a different day and age right now than it was when I was playing. Um, but yeah, we would, we did, you know, like in the off season, we would just play some pickup games, which mm -hmm. is fun. Um, we uh, we would organize. We had great traditions with some of the other athletes, student athletes. We always had a swimmer versus um, girls so women's soccer game every year. It was an annual oh, thing, wow. and and whoever lost had to host the the get together afterwards. <laughs> um, it was so much fun. We had this this amazing group of upperclassmen, um, they always hosted get togethers at their house and it was so much fun. I mean, they, cause the, I mean, I probably didn't give them enough credit then as I should have thinking back on it. They just wanted to have a good time with their team. Yeah. You know, they were competitive, they were good players and they were leaders. Um, but they weren't into any of the, the drama or the, the mind games or any cattiness. It was just, Hey, look, we're a team, like it, take advantage of it. You know, let's have a great time. Um, so they would host parties, um, for us. And then my, the favorite thing for me, we had a group, I mean, it's Florida state and I mean, I guess I can't say how it is now cause I'm way too old for that, but, <laughs> um, we loved to dance and there were so many, dance clubs around here. So we would, the intensity that we would pour into training to, in, um, at practice and then games and all the extra stuff, we would then go get banded like right after a game so we could go dancing after and the dancing, it was so much fun. It was the best release of just all that extra energy, sure. right? I don't know how we had it now. <laughs> I couldn't imagine doing that now, but we just had a great time always just being together. Um, and it was fun. Yeah. But I don't, I think the culture's changed a little bit uh, at Florida State now with soccer where they are much more disciplined about things, but they've, I mean, Marco Corrin has done a phenomenal job of taking what the foundation that we started 
and developing it into a true dynasty. Um, it's he has managed to like almost professionalize the so women's soccer culture because players literally go to Florida State now to ensure that they can play professionally. Sure. And that doesn't happen yeah. everywhere. You know, usually it's like college is just the end destination. Yeah, yeah. Well, now they literally go to Florida State so they can get drafted. So he's done a phenomenal job taking it to that next level. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to help you get fit. Christine here from Sweat with Sods. Being at home has a lot of people in a rut with their workouts, but you don't have to be. My hit at home workouts require no equipment and can be done in 30 minutes or less. And if hit isn't for you, I also design custom programs that can be done virtually, in person, or a combination of both. I put my years of experience teaching classes and personal training into all of my programs. I've worked with lots of people and helped them achieve very different goals. So what are you waiting for? Head to sweatwithstats.com today. And don't forget that as a listener to this podcast, you can get a discount with code DYNAMIC at checkout. Can't wait to hear from you. And now, back to the show. You know, so, sometimes I, I get caught, I think, stuck between, like, I want the college experience to be more pure than it can be sometimes. And then at other times, I'm, I'm like, this is really cool, especially a, a women's program now that is, uh, for lack of a better word, being a factory for professional and for national women uh, soccer teams to, you know, take those players and, and develop them. Because, I mean, you see it with men all the time. Like, I, I went to school at Penn State, and how many Penn State football players say, I'm coming here for three years. It, I'm not I'm not really coming here for, for the school. I'm not really coming here for, you know, maybe the party environment or anything like that. I'm coming here because Penn State football is a football factory that can get me to the NFL. Right. And right. so, and so, you know, sometimes that makes you a little bit sad because you do want to believe in the in the purity of athletics, especially at the amateur level. But you also know these people want their payday. And, and that is a really cool development, I think, to your point with all of that. What I also love with what you said about some of the social gatherings, I, I mean, for me personally, too, like the spaghetti dinners that we had uh, with my baseball team, for example, and, and I think I was the same way. I don't think I gave the upperclassmen enough credit at the time for doing it. And, and again, I mean, we're guys and guys are a little bit different than girls in some ways, you know, fundamentally. And I don't know that there's as much drama, but there's certainly drama among guys, especially at, at that age, you know, if you're fighting over a girl or, you know, what, whatever it might be. And, uh, those upperclassmen, when we we won a sectional title and we came within and out of going to the final four my one year, uh, they they were no drama. It, it was just all about let's and none and most of them weren't even playing. So it was like the same thing. They were leading the way and not letting the fact that we were better, the younger players, and we were the ones like yeah you know, on the field getting it done. And they just wanted you know to spend time with us and to get to know us. And then like you fast forward especially by by the time my senior year happens and we're not doing any of that type of stuff we're far more talented than we ever were and we get bounced in the first round because right. we're not as close a team and yeah. um so i think that's a really simple one and i'm sure there's ways that you can do it social distance uh you know even even in a covid world but yeah. the <laughs> the one where you had the swimmer in, uh in the soccer so explain that one a little bit more. Was that like an individual, like someone would swim against the swimmer and then someone would like, you know, take penalty kicks against some oh, on gosh. the soccer team or. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think we would have gotten crushed. I don't know why actually, <laughs> why it was never like that. We just we <laughs> played a soccer game against them. Oh, um, okay. Okay. So it was, it was men's and women's swim team and diving and we would play against them. And it was, it was just a riot. I mean, just so much fun, <laughs> just a legit soccer game um, over on our practice field every year. I don't know if they still do it. I would hope they do, but I have no idea, but it was a blast. Gosh, it would, yeah, it would have been terrifying if we, we couldn't swim. We would probably just float, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't be a chance, no chance at all. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if you had someone who stepped up and like, hey, I'm, I'm a good swimmer. I'll, I'll take uh, the challenge or something like <laughs> right. that. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, strictly what we were good at soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take them, take them onto our field. See, see if you could beat us and then we'll figure yeah. out who's hosting. <laughs> and it was good. Cause I mean, the swimmer, they're fast, you know, and they have endurance sure. for days. So 
um, I think we won every time, but it was, I think it was just a good excuse to, to make sure we had a, a good get together afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. So, so cool. <laughs> so, uh, Ashley, one of your distinctions then in your professional careers, you were, uh, the first Hispanic female COO in the national women's soccer league. Uh, that is, uh, obviously a breakthrough, um, you know, for, for race, uh, and, and just, I, I mean, I grew up in a, in a, in an area that, um, you know, had a little bit more diversity when it, when it came to all that. So I was a little bit more exposed than someone like my wife who grew up like in the same type of area as you. And, um, you know, only had like one or two people from uh, a different background. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's obviously an awesome distinction to have, and I'm sure something that you're proud of, but what I'm most curious about is like how you got to that position, like how you were able to ascend into uh, a leadership position like that uh, in the league, uh, especially because, you know, knowing that um, the, the national women's soccer league is obviously doing really well now, but there was a league before that that had folded and, you know, kind of took a lot of traction. So how did you get involved with all that? And how did you get into that position? Yeah. So, um, but just to be clear, it was for the CEO for the Washington spirit. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Of the NWSL, just so there's, <laughs> there, there's no confusion there, but, um, yeah, it goes back to relationships and connections, right? So, um, I had been coaching in the Northern Virginia area for a while, um, DC Metro area. And, uh, one of the coaches that I ended up coaching with, uh, I, was just getting in. I'm like, let me try some high school. I was doing, you know, ODP coaching and um, the college showcase for uh, college showcase teams for Loudon soccer. And I tried to get into high school. I'm like, that's a good way to <laughs> kind of keep tabs on where my players are and how they're getting developed. So uh, I was assistant for Chris Hummer and um, he ran the soccer wire and we just created a good friendship and kept in touch over the years. Well, my kids started getting to an age where I knew I was going to have to transition out of coaching because they, I, once they started going to school, I would drop them off and then I would be gone the rest of the day. So I didn't see them. So I'm coming home at 10 at night and then weekends, you always have games. I'm like, I'm literally not seeing my kids at all holidays. There's always tournaments, not seeing them. So I had this two year transition plan. I'm like, I need to transition out of coaching. And I, again, like I kept in touch with Chris Hummer. And so he runs the, um, the soccer wire and, uh, which is a soccer publishing company. And, um, I started and he did some like event management. So I started working with him and one of their clients was DC United women, which was a semi pro team. Um, so, with that, I became the director of operations for DC United Women, which was awesome. It was a great way in because I was playing, I played W League, which was what DC United was, women was. And um, it was fun to be on the other side of things. And it was just so bizarre because, again, it comes to, it, it, a little bit of your pathway comes to the resources and connections you have, right? So when I was playing college, I thought that was it right? What do you do? Your career's over at, I mean, the theory was you peaked at 18. So I was done at 21, right? So now come find out. It's like, well, like 28, between 28 and 32. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? So when I was um, working with DC United Women, I'm like, I, these people are my age playing. And it was, it was hard to kind of adjust to that, to realize, wow, I had some, I was either lacking information or had some really poor information that my career could have continued. Right. Um, but anyways, off the soapbox. So <laughs> I started with, uh, uh, working with director of operations for them and it was awesome. Just, you know, putting on games, um, doing marketing and bidding on bidding to host a conference finals, which we did. We got the bid accepted. We got awards uh, or nominated for awards for, for media and marketing and all that. So that was a good entryway in, and I had, at that point, I was about to completely transition out of coaching. Um, and then the discussions about the NWSL started coming, right? And so we had to put together a marketing bid to, uh, to have our team, our organization become um, 
a professional team, one of the founding members of NWSL. And fortunately, it was accepted. I mean, the D.C. metro area is a phenomenal area to have a soccer team. Um, so it just it kind of just went hand over foot like that. You know, it got in with a connection that I'd stayed in touch with over the years. Um, the role just continued to grow. So my first year with them, I was still doing I was heavy on the operation side um, and then ended up taking over as as the lead in charge, you know, just under the the owner. Um, and we really worked hard to, uh, one, we got into the, the playoffs the second year, the third year we were, um, we made it to the semifinals. And then the, the, the third year there in 2016, the team ended up going to, um, the, the finals, the championship game. And that one, unfortunately that was right. Like I left my last day was April 30th and they made it to the championship game that, that year, but. It was all good. It was a great experience, um, you know, building out the professional team, but then also the second team below it and then a youth academy underneath it um, and just watching how we could engage and activate the the community, but then also continually working on player standards, which we're still far away from where they should be. But it's it's a gradual process because a lot of the things need to, to continue to happen as well to make sure we keep elevating things for the the players. Sure, absolutely. And I think a couple common themes that have popped up, and I'd love if you want to add any more to it, but for everything that you've been able to accomplish in your life, the two that have stood out to me is work ethic, you know, putting in that work, working hard, and then relationship building and, you know, truly creating connections with people and not being transactional, not trying to make a quick buck, not trying to pull a quick one over somebody. Uh, it's, it seems like those have those two themes right there have afforded you so many of these opportunities. Are there any other attributes or aspects that, you know, you attribute to some of the success and some of the happiness that you've been able to find? Yeah. I think what I would add is I think you're spot on with the relationships. It's, it's not just talking to talk. You have to have, you're only as good as your last performance, right? So if you're not performing, you're not really worth what you're talking about. So I hope that, you know, my track record kind of speaks for itself, you know, with, with what I've been able to accomplish. Like, so if I'm, you know, talking to you about, you know, some other opportunity, well, then it's not just me talking. It's not just fluff. It's, Hey, look, I've been able to accomplish this no matter what. Um, but again, it comes back to competing. <laughs> I, I love a good challenge. And I, I was raised to not believe in limitations. I mean, we can only limit ourselves. That's it. Um, but, you know, the other piece I think that's a real driving force is just for me, it's always believing in something bigger than yourself. So I think I'm naturally just like a, I like, to my own detriment, I like to serve, right? Okay. And I like to help people. Um, I like to bring uh, visions to fruition, right? Make those conceptual conceptualizations reality um, and make be able to contribute to a larger impact and influence on what's going on. And that is women's soccer, right? So that driving force of like, hey, look, my career stopped here. This wasn't there, you know, this professional landscape did not exist when I was coming out this this like all these things that weren't there I'm like that's fine like I'm not bitter about that whatsoever but hey we have a great chance to make it so it is the norm right let's build things with with integrity with good thought behind it with good strategic relationships and long-term sustainable visions that that can actually make an impact and carry out, you know, women's professional soccer for a lifetime, right? You know, in a hundred years from now, we want to be, I mean, hopefully not that long, but if we want to be a success story of like the NFL, right? Right. It wasn't overnight. I mean, they've been around since what, like 1902, 1920, where am I? A hundred years. Long, long time. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't overnight. Um, it takes a while, you know, you have to change the narrative in multiple ways, but then you also need people behind the scenes. Um, and I think that's what I'm saying, like a, a big, something bigger than yourselves. Like I'm always one of those that's worked behind the scenes 
I mean, it's not for self glory, you know, it's not trying to make my name known all over the world. It's just, Hey, get in get the work done. Right. I was a defender. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't the forward that, that got all the accolades like, and that's okay. That's, you know, everyone plays a role. Um, and I'm okay with that. And I think that that really helps to be able to have that, that relentless drive to, to try to help push things forward. Sure. And I imagine a lot of what you just talked about, especially whether it comes to development and exposure and creating opportunities had to be somewhat of a driving force behind the girls Academy. And I would love if you could talk a little bit more about what is entailed in that Academy and where you're looking to take that in the near future. Yeah, gosh. So the girls Academy, again, it, it um, on April 15th, it, it was kind of just the, the standard of how it goes with women's sports, right? So it was unfortunate that, you know, U.S. soccer canned the the program, the Development Academy, for the boys and the girls, right? Um, but we in this country aren't set up yet to have a women's professional program just league, just come in and swoop in and get, you know, pick up the girls like the MLS did on the boys' side. Um, to nobody's fault, but that's just the reality we live in, right? We can't complain and moan about it. That's the reality. So how, how do we make a change? How do we make it different? Right? So with the girls Academy, it's how can we make sure we're not dependent and reliant on everybody else or these other systems or anything for our own survival, right? Because we don't want to be in the same situation that we were in on April 15th, right? right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been very much driven by let's think outside the box, let's think a little more innovatively. How What are those fun, fundamental elements that need to be laid down as pavers to really build a, a strong, sturdy foundation? And the first thing was go back to what we talked about with these these players not having voices and adults dictating what they do. So when we sat down for the governance, we're like, okay, let's write our first step one, right? What are, what's our mission, vision, core values, philosophy? We're sitting around and it's like, you look around, it's like, okay, we're doing what's been done all too often, right? Same pattern over and over again. We're just going to make decisions for these kids. I can't relate to a 13 year old or an 18 year old. So we said, well, let's ask them. So we did. We asked the players. We sent out this, this league-wide survey to the players and the clubs because clubs' voice was important too and asked them what do they envision this league to be. This is your league. Let's, let's make sure you have ownership in the league. And so they, based on all those responses, our mission, vision, core value was created. And then our philosophy just it was right in front of us. It's like, okay, it's, it's the collective and collaborative voice of our members and our members are our clubs and the largest segment of that is our, uh, our players. Um, so that's a, a big guiding force for us. Even in any decision we make is it has to be player centric. Um, we created a, an advisory panel that's the it's player led. So it's the first one that we've, um, it's ever been done, I think on the, the youth side at this level. And they engage on a monthly basis and even more, you know, frequently with us so that we can have their insight on their own journey. Right. And we can build off of that. So we're, we're taking it a whole step further. Look, it's yes, there's going to be intense competition on the field, right? You have in the girls Academy, you have youth national team players, you have college commits, you have future stars of, of the playing world, right? But then you're also going to have players that are being developed, not just as the athlete, but as the person. So we're creating this pipeline now, right? We always complain about, hey, there's there's not enough women leaders. Well, you can't just go to the top and say, there's no women leaders. How do they get there, right? Where's yeah, right. that pipeline? Well, here's the pipeline, right? So the Girls Academy, we're also trying to expose them um, to different opportunities that exist, not just at the youth level, but here's youth, here's college, here's domestic, here's international pro, you know, here's as, as a coach, as an executive board, like here's the world that you can walk into. 
right? So open as many doors as possible for them. And um, that so they are aware of the opportunities that that could exist for them. Um, and then with that, you know, to to add some legitimacy to what we're doing, we're we're being very methodical in um, who we can align with that really believes in this this vision that we have. And I think we've done a really good job with that, especially bringing um, Major League Soccer on. We just I think that announcement went out a week or two ago. Um, so we'll have a strategic relationship with them which is awesome. Um, so we can keep the, the girls guided on the pathway that they have well earned and deserved for many, many years before this even happened. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the point about unlocking those opportunities for influence and leadership and developing them and not just expecting them to be leaders as, as they were born, just like we would for <laughs> anyone else, like uh, right. giving them that platform though. I mean, I, I try to do that, not, not to pat myself on the back or anything, but that's what we're trying to do through this podcast and right. you know, have people like yourself come on so that other women and other, other younger girls, like my daughter, maybe in the future can learn from. So I, I'm definitely uh, very interested to see what the future of all that holds. I think it's really exciting. And, and I'm glad that, you know, someone who has the enthusiasm and uh, background in the sport, you know, is, is really leading the way in, in yourself. So I think it's, it's really cool. Yeah, just trying to do my part to help, right? I mean, again, it comes down to, look, the only person that can limit ourselves is ourselves. Yeah. And we have to remember that. So this coach that tried to get me to quit everything, <laughs> you know, it's like that can't happen. Like we are in control of our own destiny, right? Everything else is a hurdle and you can either jump over that hurdle or you just bulldoze that hurdle, right? <laughs> that's it. You have to be your own guide. Um, and that's that's what I hope these players um, understand and, and know that they, they do have that power through their voice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before I let you go, Ashley, the show is called Dynamic Leaders, and we've talked a ton about leadership and mm -hmm. so many other elements today. But I always like to give my guests an opportunity to shout out someone who's been influential in their own life from a leadership perspective. Do you have somebody that you want to give a quick shout out to? Yeah, I think... Um... Gosh, yeah, I think the a dynamic leader or just being a leader, it's so subjective, right? We could sit here and say all the people that we see on TV are leaders, right? Or mm -hmm. the people that we have um, put on a platform because they've won a championship or they've done this or that. Like, wow, that's a great leader. Why is that a great leader, right? <laughs> right, right. So I would go for personal experience of um, who's actually led me and I've had to be that follower. And um, I think, you know, that, that's somebody that is guided by moral integrity, um, a vision of equitable humanity, um, someone that's always willing to learn, listen, and serve, and someone that inspires you to be better, a person that can navigate the, uh, the toughest challenges and see through the darkest days with their positive light, right? Um, it's not fleeting, so it's not just based on, hey, you're you're meeting these kind of measurable goals or not, but it's it's a person that it's a leader based on the success and growth and development of their followership, right? Or their subordinates um, and their ability to to affect positive progress. So I guess this is a long winded answer, but um, <laughs> I think the the one that I would shoot my mom She's the, the best leader I know because I think she's done a phenomenal job of leading myself and my brother to be uh, dynamic individuals ourselves, just guided by a, a, you know, a higher moral integrity you know, and, and uh, instilled in us to be confident and dare to be different. Um, and she's truly the one that's always led us to believe that there are no limitations. Um, yeah, so she's, she's definitely my dynamic leader. I couldn't, and I know she's had her own career too. So I'm sure she has employees that would, would say similar things, but, um, <laughs> the best person to be around the best kind of guide it, guide to have, and, uh, definitely somebody to, to look up to and admire and inspire to be. 
Yeah, I I love it, and I love I love the detail leading up to it because that that just helps me paint. I I don't know your mom obviously, so <laughs> helps me paint more of a picture as to who she is, and and uh, on top of the description that you gave as well. So I think that's an awesome way to end this conversation. It's been so enjoyable for me, Ashley, to learn a little bit more about you and just learn about all the things that you're still doing for the sport of soccer and doing from a leadership perspective. I really can't thank you enough for all the work. Right. No, thanks for having me. It's been a blast and, you know, just, uh, trying to do my part. And I know there's, there's hundreds and thousands of people behind the scenes, you know, trying to do their part as well. And I think, you know, we just got to keep pushing forward and, and working together and making these good connections. So appreciate you getting all the the voices out and and putting some positivity and, and constructiveness out there too.